This case might be disturbing to some viewers. While I never go into brutal detail on any of the crimes, nor do I show disturbing photos, the case itself is very disturbing on its face. Viewer discretion is advised. Jane Doe, number 4873, and Jane Doe, number 6607, identified as Susan Marlene Knorr and Sheila Sanders, who were sisters. This started out as a simple Doe identification video, but the more I dug into it, the more complicated and horrifying it became. I realized this is a higher profile case, but I hadn't heard of it, which is in part why I chose to cover it. 17-year-old Susan was reported missing by her mother, Teresa Knorr, from Sacramento, California, in 1984. The following year, her sister Sheila went missing from Sacramento at age 20. Was it bad luck for the family or something worse? Well, it turns out it was something far, far worse. Teresa Knorr grew up with an abusive father and her mother died of heart failure when she was 16. Everything fell apart further when her father lost the house. It wasn't long, however, before the 16-year-old found herself pregnant. She promptly dropped out of school and married Cliff. She went from one bad situation to another, it seems, as it appeared her marriage was quickly in trouble. From those who witnessed it, they reported that Teresa was hard to be around and jealous. She couldn't stand it if Cliff paid attention to any other woman. She was constantly accusing him of cheating on her, but it's unclear if it's true or not that he did. Cliff likely wasn't the ideal husband, as she reported him to the police for punching her in the face. She pressed charges and then dropped them, like many abused women do. Their child, Howard, was the firstborn. Things got worse the day after Clifford's 23rd birthday. Teresa was livid. She was pregnant with her second child, and Clifford instead chose to stay out partying with his friends to celebrate the night before, leaving her home alone with their son. After she got done berating him, he told her that's it, he'd had it. He was leaving her, and he walked out the door. As he was leaving, Teresa shot Clifford in the back, killing him. She was promptly arrested and tried for Clifford's murder. At the trial, he was painted as an abusive alcoholic, saying she shot him in self-defense in the back. His family was adamant that Cliff was a good guy, who was neither abusive or alcoholic, and he was shot in the back. Amazingly, a jury believed her and acquitted her six months after she gave birth to Sheila, who would eventually become her second missing daughter. After Sheila was born, Teresa became an alcoholic herself, and she met her next boyfriend, Estelle Lee Thornsbury a disabled veteran working at the bar. It worked out perfect for her because once she moved in with him, she had a built-in babysitter. She just kept going out to the bar, leaving her kids at home with him, but this abruptly came to an end when the husband realized his best friend was having an affair with Teresa, and she would sometimes stay with that man for days at a time. So that was it. He was done. Sadly for the kids, that meant they were no longer in a secure place with someone stable caring for them. Teresa landed on her feet, however. It didn't take her long to meet a new man, a Marine named Robert Knorr. She quickly became pregnant with her third child, and soon after, the couple got married. This was when Susan Marlene Knorr was born. Susan would one day be the first child of Teresa's who went missing. Eventually, two more boys would arrive and another girl. The six children had a really rough life, living with Teresa. Teresa didn't stop with the accusations and verbal cruelty eventually accusing Robert of also having an affair. But in this case, Robert was just as cruel as his wife. They beat each other, as well as the children. The last child, Teresa, was born in 1970. That same year, Robert would walk out and ask for a divorce, which was granted in 1971. Robert apparently made some effort to see the kids at first after the divorce, but Teresa blocked access, and he gave up. She followed her regular pattern with the next two husbands, Verbal abuse, physical abuse, drinking benders at the bar, sometimes for days, and leaving the kids with her husband. There were many bizarre events. For instance, one night she was extremely drunk, which wasn't abnormal, and she decided she wanted to pluck her eyebrows and eyelashes. The next morning she woke up to no eyebrows and no eyelashes. She was upset and decided one of the girls did it, not her. She demanded her husband go and get the girls, and they proceeded to burn the children with cigarettes, demanding they admit who plucked her eyebrows off. But they wouldn't lie, and they knew she had done it herself. 
When they just kept telling the truth, her mother concluded it to be Susan, because Susan must be jealous of her mother's good looks. By the end of her fourth divorce, she had gained a lot of weight, and she was shutting herself up in the house. It wasn't enough just to shut herself off, though. She disconnected the phone to stop her children from having access to outsiders. They weren't allowed to see friends or family. The youngest daughter was close with the last husband, which only enraged Teresa. The oldest child, Howard, got the heck out and moved out of town to get away from her as soon as he was of age. She disconnected the phone to stop her children from having access to outsiders. The children didn't go out. It appears that school was the only time they were allowed to leave. Although Teresa was known to encourage Susan to enter stores to steal items for her mother. As a result, Susan became quite good at theft. When she got caught, she was violently punished. Teresa became jealous of the looks of her two oldest daughters. She began force-feeding the kids in hopes of affecting their weight and making them less attractive. The more attractive they became, the crueler their mother was. One child would be forced to hold the sibling down while she burned the others. It was a terrible place to be, and she even used knives on them more than once. At some point, she decided the last husband had turned Susan into a witch. Susan became the focus of her abuse. The kids were locked off from the world, and there was no one to save her. Eventually, Susan had enough and she ran away from home, desperate to escape. She told the people in the hospital what was going on at home, and then the police were alerted. Teresa denied it all. The police simply took her word for it. While there was a little bit of red tape, they pretty quickly released Susan back to her mother's custody. Her youngest daughter, Terry, later disclosed that she thinks there may have been some visits by a social worker before her sister was sent back home. But part of the problem was that the family had been abused for so long that they thought the treatment was normal, and they had been conditioned to say that the abuse wasn't happening at all, that there was no abuse. Her mother didn't take the slight of running away lightly. After this, everything amped up worse. If the abuse was severe before, it was now abuse on steroids. Her mother used gloves while hitting her, in hopes it would keep some of the bruising down but still hurt her just as much. The other children were also forced to take turns beating Susan. Eventually, Susan would find herself handcuffed to a table in the kitchen, and the other kids were forced to stand guard. Because of this, Susan was forced to drop out of high school. Teresa became fearful of others knowing what she was doing to her kids, and eventually she forced the rest of them also to drop out of school. If there was a social worker involved, it likely didn't amount to a real case or investigation. None of the kids got an education past 8th grade, and eventually the schools didn't react to them being pulled. Terry later disclosed that she remembered being beaten and thrown in a freezer while her mother and her oldest brother sat on top of it so she couldn't get out. Every day was some sort of new horror, and the youngest daughter, Terry, often spoke at length about how normal it felt. She thought this was just how families were. Teresa kept at it and eventually decided Susan had become a witch and was casting spells that was making her mother gain weight. After all, nothing Teresa did could possibly be to blame. It's always someone else's fault. When Susan wouldn't, or more clearly couldn't, stop the imaginary spells that were being cast on her mother, Teresa shot her daughter in the back and then tossed her in the bathtub. Miraculously, Susan recovered without any treatment. For nearly two years, Susan survived with that bullet in her body, making do with her mother's treatment of her, trying to do the best she could to survive. Until two years after that event, when Teresa stabbed her with scissors, and Susan said that was it. She was done. She wants to move away. Miraculously, her mother agreed to let her go, but she had one requirement. Susan had to let her mother remove the bullet from her shoulder so there was no proof of the abuse which is ridiculous on its face because Susan was already covered with scars. But Susan would do anything to get away, and she agreed. Unfortunately, Susan got sepsis and was eventually so sick that she became delirious. Teresa, being her horrible self, couldn't even let her daughter die this way. Instead, she bound the girl with duct tape and forced the boys still in the house, casting her off on the side of the road with all of her belongings, which she set on fire. The autopsy confirmed she was still alive when this happened. Authorities were confused by the presence of adult diapers at the scene. 
She was quickly found by the authorities, but there was no clue as to who she was, and she sadly just became a Jane Doe. Because Teresa no longer had the main target at home to abuse, she moved on to the oldest sister, Sheila Sanders. By then, Sheila was 19, and for some reason she had stayed in the home, not even trying to escape. She may have been trying to protect her siblings. At some point along the way, she decided it was now Sheila's job to support the family, and she would become Sheila's pimp. A really sad fact, too, is that despite the horror of what she was being forced to do, it was the first time Sheila had ever been allowed to leave the house alone, and Sheila told her siblings that part of that was exhilarating. Teresa was thrilled that her daughter was bringing in what appeared to her to be a lot of money. Sheila's new role in the family only pleased her mother for a short time. At some point, Sheila got an STD, and her mother claimed it was spread to her by a toilet seat. Thing is, it doesn't even appear it's, it's possible to even spread an STD that way, even though it's often referred to as a possibility. Meaning, either mom blamed her daughter for something that Sheila didn't spread to her, or Teresa was abusing Sheila in more ways than one. Teresa also accused Sheila of being pregnant. As a punishment for this, she tied Sheila up and stashed her in a closet. The other children were forbidden from giving her food or water, and also from opening the closet door to even speak to her. At some point, the youngest daughter, Terry, gave Sheila a beer to drink, and the mother found out. She amped up her cruelty, and eventually Sheila was left in the closet alone for three days before the door was opened. When the door was open, Sheila was no longer alive. Teresa once again forced the boys to dispose of their sister. This time, however, some evidence was left behind. Because she didn't bother to check on Sheila, the smell of decomposition was lingering inside the apartment. Teresa, being her usual self, was only concerned for herself and forced the youngest daughter, Terry, to burn down the apartment after they moved their belongings out in the middle of the night. However, the blaze was quickly put out and the closet was still intact. And now the police were on to Teresa. They knew that someone had died there. They also removed the subfloor to retain the evidence, but they didn't know who the person was. As awful as that is, though, Teresa was still out there living her life, but just doing it in hiding. The two oldest boys were of legal age and refused to have anything to do with their mother now. The youngest daughter, Terry, was the only one not a legal adult, as she was only 16. However, Terry had it, and she managed to escape. She passed herself off as Sheila so that she was able to work legally and support herself. For some reason, Robert Jr. stayed with his mom and was the only one in contact with her. That is, until 1991, when Robert Jr. robbed a bartender and fatally shot him. It's not super surprising, as all he knew was death and brutality. He ended up in prison and Teresa again managed to slip out, and she began hiding in Salt Lake City, Utah. Terry worked so hard to get her life in order and move past the abuse. It's unclear exactly where she was living, but she went to her local police when she was of age and told the police the full story. Adding insult to injury, they also refused to believe it and dismissed it and branded her a liar. It appears they didn't even bother to check out her story, same as the police before when Susan went to them so many years before. Terry eventually started seeing a therapist. She tried reporting it, and once again, her story was dismissed. Eventually, however, the case was covered on America's Most Wanted in 1993, and Terry decided one more time to try to give her sisters their name back. This time, she phoned the hotline for Fox TV, and they guided her to detectives in Placer County, California. This is where Susan was listed as a Jane Doe. These detectives, thankfully, took her story seriously. It didn't take long for them to realize that her sisters matched the description of two different Jane Doe's, right down to every detail. Even the diapers Susan said would be with her. She had been wearing these due to symptoms she developed during sepsis. Infuriatingly, the next legal move didn't involve Teresa facing charges, but instead were directed at the participants who weren't hiding. William was arrested on November 4th, 1993, in Woodland, California, where he had been living and working. Robert Jr. faced charges during his prison sentence in Nevada, though it might be questionable as to whether or not they had been forced to do what they did by their mother. It appears that one of the boys knew where their mother was, however, and rolled on her, because they found her in Salt Lake City using her maiden name 
and working as a caretaker for an elderly woman. The evidence in the case was pretty overwhelming as to the identities of the two Jane Doe's who never had a chance to get away from their abuser and lead a life without constant pain. Her brother also confirmed the diapers, which were found with Susan. Terry described the bullet hole on her sister's back, and that was consistent also. The box Sheila was in was tied back to the brother. I would love nothing more than to say, Terry, the most innocent of all the siblings, lived happily ever after. I can't think of anyone more deserving of that ending, but Terry Knorr died in 2011, at the age of 41. Some reports said she had a heart attack, and another post suggests she took her own life. She had a public Facebook account that addressed all of her struggles and abuse in hopes of helping others. It was in this group that she shared photos and details about her life. According to her nephew, who I think may be the nephew of her last boyfriend, she was a wonderful person who finally found someone good to her in the way that she deserved. He lovingly called her by the nickname of Aunt Booty instead of Aunt Terry. It appears this was an inside joke and that Terry had quite the sense of humor. Other posts indicate that while she had no biological children, she had numerous kids who loved her. If she did take her own life, it feels personally a little more correct to say that her mother took the lives of all three girls. The abuse haunted Terry throughout her time on Earth. Terry wrote her story out, and it's posted on the memorial page on Facebook. Teresa Norm was eventually convicted of torturing and murdering both Susan and Sheila. She got two consecutive life sentences and is being housed in Chino, California. She appeared before the Board of Parole hearings on July 3, 2019, after a program for elderly inmates deemed her eligible. However, the Board of Parole declined her release and set a new hearing date in five years. That date will be July of 2024. She will officially come up for parole again in 2027. It appears Robert Knorr Jr. actually got out of the prison in Eli, Nevada. I have mixed feelings about the boys being prosecuted for their involvements in their sister's death because the driving force was always their mother and the fear of what she would do to them. But Robert clearly ended up in the best place to protect the public from the monster his mother helped make. Robert moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, and that's where my sympathy stops. He was caught downloading pornography involving children and was given eight years without the opportunity for parole. According to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, he is actually eligible for parole this year in 2022. The images he downloaded were extremely violent and extremely explicit, which I'm sure ties in part back to his upbringing. But at some point, you and you alone are responsible for the choices you make. William Nora was given probation for his involvement and ordered into therapy. It appears he stayed clear of the law ever since. There's no indication as to what happened to Howard, though he left early on and I didn't try very hard to find him, as he's a victim too. Susan Knorr went unidentified for nine years. Sheila Sanders went unidentified for eight.